Alleluia! Christ is risen! If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Lord, open our lips. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Alleluia! Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Alleluia! Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ 
shall all be made alive. Alleluia. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. But filled with the Holy Spirit, Stephen gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout, all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. The word of the Lord.
a reading from the first letter of Peter. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner. And a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The word of the Lord. A reading from the Gospel according to John. Jesus told his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, 
you will know my Father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show me the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, but if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. The Word of the Lord. I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, and welcome to the fifth Sunday of Easter. Today's homily comes to you courtesy of our beloved music director, Bill Howler. He selected hymn number 487 for our service today based on the correlation to the gospel reading we just heard. And then he told me that he wished that one day I'd preach on it because he couldn't make sense of the lyrics. And so, Bill, this is for you. And thank you for the suggestion because it has been a fun and rewarding piece to tackle. We need two pieces of context before we get into the hymn itself. First, Jesus' dialogue here in the Gospel of John, and particularly the, the part of this passage at verse 6, which has a long history of interpretation that has not always been positive or benign. While this gospel is my own personal favorite, if read carefully, it has been used by Christians throughout the centuries for horrendous acts of violence against those of other faiths, particularly especially against Jews. In this passage, Jesus' words, I am the way and the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me, have been used to dogmatically reject and persecute other religious traditions, to claim that we alone have the truth which all others must submit to, too often at the point of torture or death. However, just as John continually shows us that the disciples frequently misunderstand Jesus' meaning by taking too literal or surface a reading, I hope that we can dig deeper and find a more generous while still very devoted reading. And secondly, this hymn that we'll be singing later is based on a poem by George Herbert. He was born in Wales in 1593 to a wealthy family. His mother was a devoted patron of the arts, supporting in particular a poet named John Donne. So George grew up in this intellectually stimulating atmosphere, and he found great success, first as the public orator of Cambridge, and then in a brief career in Parliament, before he gave it all up and took orders as the rector of a small country parish. He was always in ill health, and he died just three years into his ministry at age 39, with several unpublished manuscripts. Once his collection of poetry called The Temple was published according to his after-death instructions, it became an instant success and has been beloved through the centuries, influencing many famous poets up through today. The poem which became our hymn 487 is titled The Call. I'll read it for you now. 
become my way, my truth, my life. Such a way as gives us breath, such a truth as ends all strife, such a light as killeth death. Come, my light, my feast, my strength, such a light as shows a feast, such a feast as mends in length, such a strength as makes his death. Come, my joy, my love, my heart, such a joy as none can move, such a love as none can part, such a heart as joys in love. So the first observation is this poem is obviously structured as a pattern of three sets of three, beginning with those three key words that Jesus uses of himself, way, truth, and life. The first thing to notice is that Herbert has relativized the language. Rather than using objective, descriptive terms with the way, he speaks relationally to my way, and then he expands on such a way. It is very intimately personal and devotional rather than objective and universally definitive. This is the language of mysticism, of personal and a direct encounter with the divine, rather than that of traditional religious doctrine and dogma. So he addresses his subject with three pleas and then a threefold expansion of each of those. Let's look more closely at each of these stanzas. When Herbert asks, come my way, my truth, my life, he follows up by describing a way that gives breath. In the Hebrew tradition, the word ruach means both breath and spirit. Here he is playing with the double meaning of this word, of life and of the Holy Spirit, that breath of God which Jesus promises to his disciples in another section of this long conversation in this gospel. The truth that he desires is one that ends strife. Strife is defined as heated, often violent conflict. We often think of this as outside ourselves, amongst people around us. But I think in this context, it's really referring to an inner state rather than outer. For him, truth is that which resolves division between human and human, between human and nature, but also between human and God, between us and our own souls. The mystic tradition often points to the necessary resolving of false dualisms, of recognizing that our perception of distance from God is an illusion rather than an actual fact. It is about accepting the truth that we have always been forgiven, always been loved, and always been connected. And this results in a life beyond the shadow of death that hangs over us. The second stanza begins, Come my light, my feast, my strength. In the lines which follow, we see how interconnected and then constructive, building on each other, these elements are. The light reveals the feast, the feast renews, and the strength makes a death. To mend something has the connotation, once again, of reuniting two torn halves to stitch together something that originally was whole, but was broken apart. It is only after this that the strength is granted for the protagonist to become a guest, one who sits at a seat of honor and partakes in the banquet on equal terms with the host. No more is this one refusing to consider themselves unworthy to be at table but joyfully accepts the invitation from God, knowing now that they are truly loved and wanted. 
And then the third and final stanza amplifies and gives us a sense of completion of this theme as the poet calls, come my joy, my love, my heart. This emphasis resolves in clarity. The call is about reuniting union connection, these core goals of the mystery experience. It is a state which is independent of circumstance, immovable, indivisible. For Herbert, the telos, the goal of the way of Christ, is a heart which is fulfilled in love and joy in a reconnected, integrated state. So here are two things I'm taking away from this reading. First, if we choose to read Jesus' words the way Herbert does, we find a whole different layer to their meaning. Remember, in our gospel selection, Jesus is directly addressing personal questions from his beloved disciples right there with him. These are personal statements, relational statements. They are not meant, they are not couched as objective facts. This is language of devotion. For example, when someone says, my child is the most beautiful, or my hamster is the best, we know they are not making a scientific claim that they are expecting to stand up to thorough research and peer review. This is the language of love, affirming devotion in relationship. In the same way, we Christians can affirm and follow Jesus exclusively as our life-giving way, our unifying truth, our death-dismissing life, while still celebrating and affirming somewhat parallel yet distinctly different traditions and devotions from our neighbors in Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and others. And second, what George Herbert has outlined for us could be perceived as a threefold path to undoing that eternal tragedy we call the fall, our separation from God. And these steps he outlines are, first, to enter into the spirit which gives life, ends our internal strife, and destroys the power that death holds over us. And then to rest at the feast revealed by light where our tears, our cares are mended so that we are finally able to accept the invitation as guest of God. And then finally, we are to be in union, immovable, indivisible, rooted in the heart with joy and love. I even wonder if the poet intended these three sections to be metaphorically addressing the three aspects of what it means to be human. First, our mind must be healed. The spirit comes to resolve our mental turmoil and to release our bondage to the fetters of death consciousness. Second, our body needs wholeness to allow ourselves to accept healing and to accept the desire of the holy for ourselves who so often feel unworthy. And then third, our heart, the center of where human meets God, can then be our center of being and going out into the world. For Herbert, as for many mystics, the barrier between God and man is one that is something we have built and we have insisted on and which God desires to release us from. Once again, to be a mystic is to seek direct, unmediated connection to God. And in John's gospel, that's exactly what Jesus is offering his disciples. Philip tells Jesus, well, just show us the Father then so we can be happy. And I can just hear Jesus sigh. You've seen me, who is so deeply interconnected with the Father that there is no division, no difference between us. I have shown you this way, now walk in it. And so as we close today, let's think on these two things which Herbert has proposed in his poem, which we will shortly sing as a hymn. 
First, that our devotion to the depth of the Christian path does not require dismissal or abuse of others, and that the way of Jesus, which offers truth and life, is a journey inward toward wholeness through the mending of the division of sin and coming to true belief in our deepest core that we are loved and desired as God's companions at the feast with a heart full of joy and love. Amen. Let us join together in saying the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. Lord, keep this nation under your care. Let your way be known upon earth. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Create in us clean hearts, O God. O God, whose Son, Jesus, is the Good Shepherd of your people, grant that when we hear his voice, we may know each by name and follow where he leads, who, you and the Holy Spirit, lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, almighty and everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose, 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us call upon God to hear our prayers and to grant us those things that are in accord with the divine will, responding, Hear us, O risen Christ. For Christians who are imprisoned and persecuted for their faith, that, like Stephen, they may follow the light that casts out all fear, let us pray. that we may do the works that Jesus revealed in his ministry, the healing of the sick, the raising up of the lowly, the giving of sight to the blind, and the blessing of the poor and the the grieving. Let us pray. For those who are spiritually lost, or who question their faith, or whose souls are wrapped in the shadows of doubt, that they may share their misgivings with Jesus, who gently unfolds the truth and reveals a way. Let us pray. That the church, the community of the baptized, may vigorously proclaim the Alleluia's of Easter, revealing the light of Christ, whose victory over death breaks the chains of darkness and despair. Let us pray. In thanksgiving for the beauty that is set before our eyes, and for the mysteries yet unseen, that we may honor the expansiveness of creation and be guardians of its splendor, let us pray. In thanksgiving for missionaries throughout the world who reveal God's word in challenging times and places, let us pray. that the Lord may comfort those in the waning days of life and bring to life eternal those who have died in the hope of the resurrection, let us pray. As a chosen people who share the royal priesthood of Christ, let us add to these petitions. We pray now for those on our prayer list. Tom, Lynn, Colleen, Marion, Shirley, Marty, Mason, Jay, Jerry, Lauren, Odell, Irene, Rich, Kevin, Raylan, Mike, Carrie, Alicia, Lee, Doug, Greg, Fred, Guy, Wendy, Donna, Michael. For all who have died in communion of your church, and those whose faith is known to you alone, that, with all the saints, they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal, we pray to you, O Lord. We also pray for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Mike, our bishop, John, our priest, and Al, our deacon. On the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for St. Timothy's in the Valley, Hurricane. And in our companion diocese in Colombia, we pray for the Reverend Julio Salazar, Mission Santa Maria Magdalena. Additional prayers may be offered at this time, either silently or aloud. Lord, we pray for the safety, support, and provision of those deemed essential workers in this time, that we may truly value the contributions of these people as a society. We pray, as always, for health for those in our parish, in our community, and around the world. We pray for the end of this pandemic and the coming together again. Amen. 
almighty and ever-living God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear our prayers for this parish family. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, and restore the penitent. Grant us all things necessary for our common life, and bring us all to be of one heart and mind within your holy church, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us join together now in the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. So we remember now those with birthdays within our parish. We remember Gabriel, Bernie, and Matt as their birthdays are this week. And so let us join together in this birthday prayer. Gracious God, as we rejoice in the birthday of these your children, we pray that the year ahead will be one of blessing and peace and that the year will bring continual joy 
in the knowledge of your steadfast grace and love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So, announcements for today. First, a reminder that we have our uh, Wisdom Jesus book study happening before the service every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock on Zoom. You're welcome to join us whether or not you have a book and at any time. We also follow this service with our virtual coffee hour at 11, again on Zoom. Let's get together and have some chats and share what's going on in our lives. We have uh, our evening prayer this week only on Tuesday. Uh, Thursday night is our vestry meeting, so um, only Tuesday at 7.30 will we have the live evening prayer. We have a special service tonight. Um, our diocesan children's minister, Catherine Sachs, will be leading a family Compline service at 7 p.m. tonight on Zoom. So you are welcome to follow the link in our bulletin and be able to access that with children. And I believe that should be a fun event to connect with those people around our diocese. We will be continuing our live streaming or recording uh, services for now. Our bishop has just released some new guidance. Our parish closures are required now through May 30th. And after that, we are given room to decide what we want to do next. We don't know yet if it's going to be safe to reopen or how um, or what timing that will be, but our church leadership, our vestry, some of our advisors who have expert advice in this will be giving us some help over the next week or two and we'll be announcing some details and some dates and some information soon. Uh, we do plan to continue uh, the, the streaming and the videos as a primary way to be part of our services uh, for those who particularly are not going to be able to gather safely again for a while. That will be going on indefinitely and um, we will just let you know how we can continue coming back in stages and with safe, safety guidelines beginning on the Feast of Pentecost. And now, may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 